At the age of 64, Abner Schoenwetter is trying to start his life over again. After 12 years in a highly competitive industry, his partnership involving this Honduran seafood processing warehouse had made him one of Florida's most successful seafood importers. So how is it that this hard-working businessman with no criminal history became a convicted felon, sentenced to over eight years in federal prison? Abner's troubles began when federal agents seized a routine shipment of Caribbean lobsters that he had purchased from a Honduran fisherman, David Hanson McNabb. Hanson McNabb's boat came in with a shipment of 70,000 pounds of lobster tails. All of a sudden, the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service and Customs showed up. And we had already cleared Customs and FDA for that particular load on the water, which was normal. They stopped us and they said, we don't know why we're stopping you, but we were ordered to stop you. Now put the product back in the container. We have a pretty good idea that the anonymous fax was sent by one of our competitors. This last particular shipment was one of the hardest ones we had where the bidding went on for a while, and in fact, we got to a point where we almost were gonna turn it down. We were always in competition, every shipment, to buy uh, Henson McNabb's product. As this document prepared by the Department of Commerce shows, Abby and Henson McNabb were cited for shipping the product in the clear plastic bags they had always used, instead of cardboard containers, supposedly required by Honduran regulations. Investigators also charged them with mixing undersized lobster tails within the rest of the shipment, an accusation contained in the anonymous facts. Initially, the seizure was considered an annoyance, a civil matter at worst, but as it turned out, the federal government had been building a criminal case against Abby for quite some time. We came to find out that the government had already sent investigators two or three times to Honduras prior to them even processing McNabb's product, and they were developing a criminal case against us even when they were uh, declaring that it was only a civil matter. So we weren't, we weren't Actually, we were unprepared for, for what came afterward. I get a call at seven in the morning and somebody on the other end says, Mr. Schoenwetter, this is the FBI, come to the front door. And I come to the front door and there's about 13 representatives of the FBI, the IRS, National Marine Fisheries Service, Customs, all with guns. Prosecutors eventually brought criminal charges against Abby under a law called the Lacey Act. The Lacey Act says, I'm, I don't quote it, but it says that uh, basically if you violate the wildlife laws of another country, then the United States can prosecute you in this country. So they picked out these three wildlife regulations, which were Honduranian regulations, and charged us with violating them, and in turn became Lacey Act violations, which they were also to include smuggling into and conspiracy and in the end money laundering. Basing their case on arcane Honduran laws, government prosecutors pressed Abby to plead guilty. Because he hadn't done anything he knew was wrong or illegal, Abby chose to fight the charges in court. The Attorney General of Honduras came to his defense, submitting this letter to the court, stating that U.S. prosecutors had, quote, deemed as valid laws that the government of Honduras has determined not to be applicable to the case, unquote. Not only didn't we know anything about these regulations, but as it turned out, the government of Honduras said that the, regula the regulations in question at the time of the supposed crime uh, didn't exist or were null and void. 
Despite the Honduran government's written certification that the U.S. government was prosecuting Abby under invalid Honduran laws, the case continued. In the years that followed, the Federal Court of Appeals in Atlanta upheld Abby's conviction, and the Supreme Court refused to hear his case. His appeals exhausted, Abby began his eight-year sentence at the federal prison in Estill, South Carolina. I never knew what the worst thing in life was. You know, things happen to people, but in in my mind now, the worst thing that anybody can do to you is take away your freedom. All in all, it destroyed the health of the family and the financial ability of the family to go, you know, to just live a normal life. To be tried and convicted and spend so many years in prison because you viol supposedly violated a regulation in another country if, if somebody told me that could happen to me, I would have bet them a million dollars that never could happen in this country. How could they put you in, in prison for something like that? 